Hi all, Lauren Oliver here, author of Before I Fall, the Delirium Trilogy, Lisa and Poe and the Spindlers. I am reading from my new book, Panic, which comes out in spring 2014. I'm super excited about this book. Um, if you haven't checked out my first, the first chapter, um, which I have also read, you should watch that video first. Um, so you're all caught up. I'm going to read the next couple of chapters here, and um, I hope you love it. No one knows who, who invented panic or when it first began. There are different stories. Some blame the shuttering of the paper factory, which overnight placed 40% of the adult population of CARP, New York, on unemployment. Mike Dickinson, who infamously got arrested for dealing on the very same night he was named prom king and now changes brake pads at the Jiffy Lube on Route 22, likes to take credit. That's why he still goes to opening jump four years after graduating. None of these stories is correct, however. Panic began as so many things do in Carp, a poor town of 12,000 people in the middle of nowhere, because it was summer and there was nothing else to do. The rules are simple. The day after graduation is opening jump, and the game goes all through summer. After the final challenge, the winner takes the pot. Everyone at Carp High pays into the pot, no exceptions. Fees are a dollar a day for every day that school is in session from September through June. People who refuse to pony up the cash receive reminders that go from gentle to persuasive. Vandalized locker, shattered windows, shattered face. It's only fair. Anyone who wants to play has a chance to win. That's another rule. All seniors, but only seniors, are eligible and must announce their intention to compete by participating in the jump, the first of the challenges. Sometimes as many as 40 kids enter. There is only ever one winner. Two judges plan the game, name the challenges, deliver instructions, award, and deduct points. They are selected by the judges of the previous year in strict secrecy. No one in the whole history of panic has ever confessed to being one. There have been suspicions, of course, rumors, and speculation. Carp is a small town, and judges get paid. How did Mira Campbell, who always stole extra lunch from the school cafeteria because there was no food at home, suddenly afford her used Honda? She said an uncle had died. But no one had ever heard of Mira's uncle. No one really had ever thought about Mira until she came rolling in with the windows down, smoking a cigarette, with the sun so bright on the windshield it almost completely obscured the smile on her face. Two judges, picked in secrecy, in secret, sworn to secrecy, working together. It must be this way. Otherwise, they'd be subject to bribes and possibly to threats. That's why there are two, to make sure that things stay balanced, to reduce the possibility that one will cheat and give out information, leak hints. If the players know what to expect, then they can prepare. And that isn't fair at all. It's partly the unexpectedness, the never knowing, that starts to get to them and weeds them out one by one. The pot usually amounts to just over $50,000 after fees are deducted and the judges, whoever they are, take their cut. Four years ago, Tommy O'Hare took his winnings, bought two items out of Hawk, one of them a lemon yellow Ford, drove straight to Vegas and bet it all on black. The next year, Lauren Davis bought herself new teeth and a new pair of tits and moved to New York City. She returned to Carp two Christmases later, stayed just long enough to show off a new person and even newer nose, and then blew back to the city. Rumors floated back. She was dating the ex-producer of some reality TV weight loss show. She was becoming a Victoria's Secret model, though no one has ever seen her in a catalog, and many of the boys have looked. Conrad Spurlock went into the manufacture of methamphetamines, his father's line of business, and poured the money into a new shed on Mallory Road after their last place burned straight to the ground. But Sean McManus used the money to go to college. He's thinking of becoming a doctor. In seven years of playing, there have been three deaths. Four, including Tommy O'Hare, who shot himself with the second thing he bought at the pawn shop after his number came up red. You see, even the winner of Panic is afraid of something. So. Back to the day after graduation, the opening day of panic, the day of the jump. Rewind to the beach, but pause a few hours before Heather stood on the ridge, suddenly petrified, afraid to jump. Turn the camera slightly, we're not quite there. Almost, though. Dodge. No one on the beach was cheering for Dodge Mason. No one would cheer for him either, no matter how far he got. It didn't matter. All that mattered was the win. And Dodge had a secret. He knew something about panic, knew more about it probably than any of the other people on the beach. Actually, he had two secrets. Dodge liked secrets. They fueled him, gave him a sense of power. When he was little, he'd even fantasized that he had his own secret world, a private place of shadows where he could curl up and hide. 
Even now, on Dana's bad days, when the pain came roaring back and she started to cry, when his mom hosed the place down with Febreze and invited over her newest piece of shit date, and late at night Dodge could hear the bed frame hitting the wall, like a punch in the stomach every time, he thought about sinking into that dark space, cool and private. Everyone at school thought Dodge, Dodge was a pussy. He knew that. He looked like a pussy. He'd always been tall and skinny, angles and corners, his mom said, just like his father. As far as he knew, the angles and the dark skin were the only things he had in common with his dad, a Dominican roofer his mom had been with for one hot second back in Miami. Dodge could never even remember his name, Roberto or Rodrigo, some shit like that. Back when they had first gotten stuck in carp, that's how he always thought about it, getting stuck. He, Dana, and his mom were just like empty plastic bags skipping across the country on fitful bits of wind, occasionally getting snagged around a telephone pole or under the tires of some semi, pinned in place for a bit. He'd been beat up three times, once by Greg O'Hare, then by Zev Keller, and then by Greg O'Hare again, just to make sure that Dodge knew the rules. And Dodge hadn't swung back, not once. He'd had worse before. And that was Dodge's second secret and the source of his power. He wasn't afraid. He just didn't care. And that was very, very different. The sky was streaked with red and purple and orange. It reminded Dodge of an enormous bruise or picture taken of the inside of a body. It was still an hour or so before the sunset and before the pot and the jump would be announced. Dodge cracked a beer, his first and only. He didn't want to be buzzed and didn't need to be either. But it had been a hot day and he'd come straight from Home Depot and he was thirsty. The crowd had just started to assemble. Periodically, Dodge heard the muffled slamming of a car door, a shout of greeting from the woods, the distant blare of music. Whippoorwill Road was a quarter mile away. Kids were just starting to emerge from the path, fighting their way through the thick underbrush, swatting away hanging moss and creeper vines, carting coolers and blankets and bottles and iPads, iPod speakers, staking out patches of sand. School was done, for good forever. Of all the places he had lived, Chicago, D.C., Dallas, Richmond, Ohio, Rhode Island, Oklahoma, New Orleans, New York smelled the best. Like growth and change, things turning over and becoming other things. Ray Hanrahan and his friends had arrived first. That was unsurprising. Even though competitors weren't officially announced until the moment of the jump, Ray had been bragging for months that he was going to take home the pot, just like his, his brother had two years earlier. Luke Hanrahan had won just barely in the last round of panic. Luke had walked away with 50 grand. The other driver hadn't walked away at all. If the doctors were right, she'd never walk again. Dodge flipped a coin in his palm, made it disappear, then reappear easily between his fingers. In fourth grade, his mom's boyfriend, he couldn't remember which one, had bought him a book about magic tricks. They'd been living in Oklahoma that year, a shithole in a flat bowl in the middle of the country, where the sun singed the ground to dirt and the grass to gray, and he'd spent a whole summer teaching himself how to pull coins from someone's ear and slip a card into his pocket so quickly it was unnoticeable. It had started as a way to pass the time, but had become a kind of obsession. There was something elegant about it, how people saw without seeing, how the mind filled in what it expected, how the eyes betrayed you. Panic, he knew, was one big magic trick. The judges were the magicians. The rest of them were just a dumb, gaping audience. Mike Dickinson came next, along with two friends, all of them visibly drunk. The dick's hair had started to thin, and patches of his scalp were visible when he bent down to deposit his chlor on the beach. His friends were carrying a half-rotted lifeguard chair between them, the throne where Diggin, the announcer, would sit during the event. Dodge heard a high whine. He smacked unthinkingly, catching the mosquito just as it started to feed, smearing a bit of black on his bare calf. He hated mosquitoes. Spiders, too, although he liked other insects, found them fascinating. Like humans, in a way. Stupid and sometimes vicious, blinded by need. The sky was deepening. The light was fading and so were the colors, swirling away behind the line of trees beyond the ridge as though someone had pulled the plug. Heather Nill was next on the beach, followed by Nat Velez, and lastly, Bishop Marks, trotting happily after them like an overgrown sheepdog. Even from a distance, Dodge could tell both girls were on edge. Heather had done something with her hair, he wasn't sure what, but it wasn't wrestled into its usual ponytail, and it even looked like she might have straightened it. And he wasn't sure, but he thought she might have been wearing makeup. He debated getting up and going over to say hi. Heather was cool. He liked how tall she was, how tough too, in her own way. He liked her broad shoulders and the way she walked, straight backed, even though he was sure she would have liked to be a few inches shorter. Could tell from the way she wore only flats and sneakers with worn down soles. But if he got up, he'd have to talk to Natalie. 
and even looking at Natalie from across the beach made his stomach seize up like he'd been kicked. Nat wasn't exactly mean to him, not like some of the other kids at school, but she wasn't exactly nice either, and that bothered him more than anything. She usually smiled vaguely when she caught him talking to Heather, and as her eyes skated past him, through him, he knew that she would never, ever actually look at him. Once, at the homecoming bonfire last year, she'd even called him Dave. He'd gone just because he was hoping to see her. And then in the crowd, he'd spotted her, had moved toward her, buzzed from the noise and the heat and the shot of whiskey he'd taken in the parking lot, intending to talk to her, really talk to her, for the first time. Just as he was reaching out to touch her elbow, she had taken a step backward onto his foot. Oops, sorry Dave, she'd said, giggling. Her breath smelled like vanilla and vodka, and his stomach had opened up, and his guts went straight into his shoes. There were only 107 people in their graduating class out of the 150 who started at Carp High freshman year, and she didn't even know his name. So he stayed where he was, working his toes into the ground, waiting for the dark, waiting for the whistle to blow, and for the game to begin. He was going to win panic. He was going to do it for Dana. He was going to do it for revenge. So that's the second and third chapter of Panic. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, don't forget to add Panic to your to-read shelf. And um, thanks for watching.